This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, we're going to look at the flashing red lights on the dashboard of your life. Like So like when you're driving your car and you look at your odometer, how fast you're driving, and then there are all kinds of warning lights, especially since... Cars now incorporate all kinds of computerized technology. There's an endless array of warning lights, some in different colors, some in red. And they used to be called flashing warning lights. Now they're digital lights, but they're still warning lights. For example, the other day, I think it was yesterday, I had to get up and take a car to the car dealership for um, a repair. And I noticed a light that goes on a lot in Southern California where the studio is located. And uh, the light is uh, a yellow circular light or an orange yellow circular light with like a slash in it. Maybe you're familiar with the light that I'm talking about. And here in California, it often goes on. Uh, it's, sometimes it's a generalized warning light that something's wrong with the engine. And you have to kind of figure out what it is. But it can be warning you that there's a nail in the tire or there's a leak in your tire. But most of the time, it's a warning light that indicates to you that there's been a change in tire pressure, a significant change. And and the computerized system assumes that there's either a leak in your tire or a nail in your tire. And in California, I don't know about where you live, there's always so much construction going on that when you drive down the streets, <clears throat> you get nails in the tires all the time. But also, uh, because the way the environment here is, like the evening, the day, let's say, the day, the one day you're driving your car and let's say it's like 105 degrees out or 115 degrees out and then you park the car and then overnight there's a temperature change and, and it could be a, you know it could get quite a bit colder and so when you try to start the car in, in the early morning especially before the sun has had time to to hit the tires and the car um there's a tire pressure change due to the heat and warmth. And so usually it's a matter of temperature change that happens overnight. And it turns out to be nothing. It'll just go away. But you've got to pay attention to it anyway. But the purpose of warning lights in any electronic instrument is to warn you ahead of time of a potential danger and you're supposed to do something to correct it because if you ignore the warning lights, especially if they're serious warning lights, like if you're driving down the road and you're ignoring the fact, which I have done in my life, that your engine is getting overheated and, and theoretically you should pull off you know, immediately on the side of the road till your engine cools down. But having made this mistake at least once in my life, you know, you, you press it, you figure, well, I can go a couple more miles or whatever till I get to a gas station. Well, it's a very dangerous thing to ignore uh, an engine overheating warning light <laughs> because what will happen, and it happened to me, you blow your engine. Your engine gets so hot because the warning light's trying to tell you the temperature of your engine's getting dangerously hot, and it turned out to be a leak in the radiator and so when the radiator has a significant leak and all the liquid or coolant leaves the radiator well you know what happens your engine fries I mean it becomes so hot that literally <clears throat> the engine locks up and then you see the steam and if you let it go long enough your engine will catch on fire and it'll explode so that's happened to me at least once, and you learn the price for ignoring the flashing warning lights. 
The same thing with your human body. The same thing with other things. When you're ignoring warning signs, you're, you put yourself in jeopardy or danger. So America and the rest of the world is it's like we're all collectively driving these vehicles and in America especially we have had over the past several decades a series of warning lights regularly going off on the dashboards of our vehicles which is a metaphor for uh, what's going on in our life what's going on in the life of our nation And we keep seeing these reoccurring warning lights, but we keep ignoring them. You know, we rationalize them away. We say it's nothing. And, you know, many times you can get away with it for years. You can get away with it for a long period of time. But eventually, there comes a day of reckoning because the warning light is what you have ignored and you have become habitually... Uh, you've kind of programmed yourself to ignore it. This time, the warning light is warning you of something serious, and you better take care of take care of it in a serious manner, or you're going to end up in a big mess. And that's kind of where we are in America. When we look at what's happening in our nation right now, there are all kinds of warning lights, and these warning lights are telling us that there's danger ahead and that we better do something about it because if we don't, if we ignore it, our way of life, our freedom, our very existence, our ability to survive is potentially jeopardized. Now I'll get real specific. Right now when you turn on the television, you are watching a war unfold on television. This has been going on literally since the election, since before the election, uh, before election day happened, there has been an unprecedented change in the way our mass media or mainstream media <clears throat> covers the news and a variety of other things. That should be ha- have been perceived as a warning light. But it, it's steadily gotten worse and worse and worse and worse until now, in my opinion, the warning light isn't flashing. It's just the red warning light or whatever you want to call it is on constantly. And I base this on just my experience, which I think you share this experience, And that is every time I turn on the television, especially if I turn on, let's say, Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or whatever, no matter when I turn it on randomly, no matter what I happen to be doing randomly, it's it's not at a set time of the day or whatever, I will immediately see, um, when I turn on the television, two distinct points of view coming at me. On one hand, I see the overwhelming majority, I would say like 99%, and that's a high figure, 99% of the mainstream media, whether it's coming at me through radio programs, whether it's television, whether it's newspapers, whether it's the internet, whether it's social media, whether it's AOL News or Bing or Yahoo or Google or whatever, 99% of the information that's coming on me uh, through technology is is designed to attack, destroy, belittle, mock Donald Trump, his policies, him as a person, constantly trying to undermine him. And, and, And let's just get right down to it. Let's just say it for what it is. There's a coup going on. There's not a coup coming. This coup has been underway ever since before he has been elected. And it's a coup in which various high-level players in the highest levels of the power centers of our society have organized, as if they were one, to take down Donald Trump through a kind of psychological warfare in which everything you see, hear, read, watch, 
is designed to um, uh, portray him as evil, a totalitarian, uh, uh, inept, incompetent, and, and on and on and on. So I will like turn on the television just for like seconds at a time because I really, I just refuse to sit there and uh, uh, focus my mind in on like a constant stream of lies. But I'll turn on the television. And so this morning I turned on the television because I wanted to see what was happening in North Carolina and what was happening with the people uh, who had been impacted by the flood, because as you recall, uh, we have been praying for the people on the East Coast impacted by the flood, and specifically the people in the North Carolina regions impacted by the flood. We, we prayed uh, live here on the Paul McGuire Report, so I wanted to check in on this. And I, I didn't know the president was making an appearance. Uh, actually, he wasn't making an appearance. He was standing there for about an hour, uh, literally um, handing uh, families that were driving up in cars, he was handing them these, you know, plastic boxes of meals. So the president of the United States of America, Donald Trump, is handing, you know, these boxes of meals, one for every person in the car. And I thought it was quite remarkable now, it's obvious he was aware of the fact that uh, news media was watching him. But the major news media had not been there because, as far as I know, they had not been alerted to the fact that he was there. He just showed up in this town area, and it was a beautifully blue sky, and everything looked kind of like it. everything was normal, except the reports came in that this town area in North Carolina, even though everything looked normal, it was next to impossible to drive into this area or drive out of the area because of the flood waters. So the people in this town were, were in a sense, had become an island and they couldn't get food and supplies in and out of there. And there were numerous other places where the same thing was going on. So I, I watched what was going on. It was very interesting. Trump uh, was there. And he was partnering with a local church. And uh, I forgot the name of the church, but they were wearing badges that indicated it was a local Christian church. And I thought that was very unusual for this reason. I couldn't recall in recent memory having ever seen the mainstream media positively cover a Christian church in a positive way. And here this church was obviously dedicated to helping the community. And then there were government officials uh, and bodyguards and uh, uh, other people, and they, they had, uh, you know, food for the people and, and bottled water, etc. But, you know, I cannot remember, and I could be wrong, I cannot remember another president... I'm talking about Democrat or Republican, who actually stood out there during one of these, you know, disasters like Katrina or all the other disasters or the earthquake. I cannot remember that when I speak of the earthquake, I'm talking about the North Ridge earthquake in uh, Southern California, which I lived through. In fact, I started writing prophecy books after the North Ridge earthquake in Southern California. And um, I couldn't remember ever seeing video footage of a president <clears throat> standing there <clears throat> and actually handing out food. I couldn't ever remember seeing that. And I thought that was odd because you would think, you know, that all these presidents would run in front of the TV cameras to get a photo op of them feeding people. It's such a simple gesture I was surprised why I couldn't remember anybody else doing that. And I thought about that for a moment. It was a simple gesture, but I couldn't recall any other president doing that, uh, Republican or Democrat. And I asked myself why. And then I tried to think even harder, because I know that politicians from both political parties 
like to be seeing doing you know good works or whatever and and usually pose in front of the camera while they're doing something charitable or good but i couldn't not only could i not remember any other president doing this in a disaster area but trump must have stood out there for an hour and a half And he personally was handing out these boxes of food, talking to the people. I mean, he was the the chief guy in line. So the people would drive up from the area, you know, four or five people in a car, and he would hand them four or five boxes of food, and he would talk to them, and then the next car would pull up. Now, if he was just doing it for a photo op, you know, he would have done it like most politicians do those type of things for a couple of minutes, and, and that's it. You would have seen it over and over again on television. But he, he genuinely wanted to do this, and I thought it was a sincere action on his part. Two is, he actually did it. All the memories I have of previous presidents in disaster areas is either they didn't show up, they were... Uh, you know, on island resorts or playing golf or or uh, in the White House or somewhere else. <clears throat> they didn't actually seem to physically show up uh, where the disaster was. I remember when uh, uh, President Clinton uh, came into Southern California after the Northridge earthquake. And what I distinctly remember from the footage, the television footage, was that he got up on some large platform somewhere and he gave a speech about the government relief efforts. He gave a speech from a platform, but I don't ever recall seeing President Clinton roll up his sleeves and get involved face-to-face, hand-to-hand with the victims of the earthquake. In other words, doing something tangibly to help them. Just, he showed up. Well, to his credit, at least he showed up, because most of the time these presidents don't show up. So I think it was a, you know, the cynical people would say it was just a photo op. I think it was more than a photo op. Um, One particular channel, which is known for being a lot fairer than the others, made the comment that he seemed to genuinely enjoy meeting and talking with the people. And this one lady pulled up, um, and they didn't censor it because it was Fox News. And the lady said, uh, we're, we're praying for you, uh, President Trump, which was a very interesting comment. So I, I, I immediately decided I wanted to just, I knew what this other channel was going to be doing, okay, even before, but I just wanted to see it with my physical eyes. So I turned the channel to CNN, just to see how CNN was covering it. Well, as to be expected, CNN was not covering at all the president physically helping the the flood victims. They, They weren't covering it. What they were doing is they were doing from inside some studio this hardcore attack against this uh, Supreme Court judge nominee, Kavanaugh, and, and the attacker, uh, a female, the whole, the whole time, I guess, instead of cover- giving any positive coverage to Trump, um, they were in the attack mode from a studio, exclusively um, uh, blowing up and promoting... Um, uh, the, the the accusations against the Supreme Court judge nominee. So so you know you can't base a, uh, uh, a programming analysis on, on one thing. But you know I've seen this kind of thing a hundred times. And so I said to myself, you know this the 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 accusation fake news regarding this network is is accurate because they are fake news. See they weren't reporting an important part of the real news, they were ignoring, and not were ignoring, they constantly ignore. Every time I turn on the channel of some of these other networks, they are constantly, habitually, religiously ignoring any news that is positive towards the president or his administration. They're always attempting to destroy him. So, 
they are fake news. And what this is, um, and this, this, by the way, is not a partisan analysis. I'm not making these statements because I'm pro-Republican and, 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 you know, not Democratic. It has nothing to do with that. It, I would be saying the same thing if the positions were reversed. The, the unfairness is so egregious. The unfairness is so out there that you would have to be deaf, dumb, numb, and dead not to, not to notice it. So what, what we're seeing is an unprecedented phenomenon, which is this, it's a organized, strategic, methodically thought out, a campaign of psychological warfare and propaganda and social engineering being carried out by the mainstream media, by the major tech giants, radio and TV, to, to initiate a coup to remove President Trump from office through a form of psychological warfare by overwhelming and bombarding the minds of the American public. I guarantee you that those of you listening that would consider yourself Trump supporters or you voted for Trump, I guarantee you that if you regularly listen to radio or watch television or whatever and you're exposed to media on a regular basis, I don't care how ardent a Trump supporter you are, I guarantee you that your mind is constantly uh, playing thoughts and ideas and concepts where you're beginning to question Trump and the, the propaganda that they're constantly pumping into your mind 24-7 into your subconscious is coming out. And you are subconsciously beginning to doubt and question Trump based on what they're saying about him. I guarantee you that's happening. Why do I know that it's happening? Because I've I've observed that dynamic happening in myself. And you see, it's not that I'm wavering in my opinion. I'm, uh, I've, I've spent decades studying uh, propaganda, social engineering, behavior modification, scientific mind control, and uh, hypnotic suggestions, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I have spent decades studying that, and one of the primary principles of propaganda and mind control is this principle of, of total saturation of the human mind in your consciousness. When you are twenty four seven, everywhere you look, read, hear, and see, being exposed to news stories, uh, commentaries, anchor men, anchor women. Uh, radio, television, etc., etc., which is constantly criticizing and showing negative images of the president. It's like it's like your mind. Um, it, think of your mind as is like your subconscious mind as as a, a somewhat empty chamber. It, it's not t- obviously totally empty, but a somewhat empty cha- chamber. And think of like a moving truck. That you didn't invite. Well, no, let's 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 tell it this way. Think of your mind and your subconscious mind as like a house that you just bought on a street, but you haven't moved in yet. So you're walking around in the interior of your newly purchased house, but it's empty because you haven't moved in yet. Now. You're, you you have scheduled a moving truck to come uh, filled with furniture and other items that you own and that moving company has a name and they're sc- scheduled to come on a particular day in a particular time. Now, what happens is well, you're walking around in the room that's empty, the house that's empty, and let's say that the that the rooms, like the living room, which is often close to the front door or off to the front door, let's call that your conscious mind because it's in the living room usually uh, where guests come and sit down, okay? It's like the outer room closest to the door and it's usually a room where 
as a family or an individual, you, you may occupy it, but it's also where friends or people visiting you would sit down and you might serve them a cup of coffee or tea or whatever. So let's call that the conscious mind, your living room. Now, you know this delivery truck the name of the company, and you scheduled a particular time for them to show up, and they're going to move in all your personal items and furniture. But what happens is, in this imaginary scenario, let's say while you're waiting, two or three moving trucks pull up to the front curb or or, or wherever to get access, the best access to move items into the house. And let's say the best access for a lot of things is the front door. Um, all of a sudden, three moving trucks come, and you don't recognize recognize the name of any of these moving companies. They didn't come on the day that you scheduled a moving company. You don't really know who they are, because you you do know this. You didn't hire these companies. These, These are strange moving companies, and they've come on a day when you didn't schedule a moving company. So all of a sudden... In this imaginary scenario, they uh, don't even knock or ring the doorbell of your house. They just open the door, invite themselves in, and then they don't even give you a chance to respond. Like, well, who are you? I didn't hire you, you know, blah, 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 blah. They don't even give you a chance to respond. They just begin taking over your house like they owned your house they don't, they don't respect your wishes. They don't respect your values. They don't respect your beliefs. And they just start putting furniture and other items and pictures and paintings on the wall wherever they want to put it. And they just ignore your, your protests. On top of that, the pictures and the furniture that they're placing all over your house, beginning with the living room, is stuff that you don't like. In fact, you hate it. it. It's the opposite of your personality. It doesn't represent your beliefs. It's not stuff that you would ever have bought or purchased. You know, the couches, you would never have bought couches like that. The paintings, you would never have, have paintings like that. So they've, so, so like, they've like intruded into your house and they, they, they kind of begin to decorate it without your permission. And then all the stuff they begin to move in you're not comfortable with you, you, you this is not the this is not your stuff and the first thing they do is they clutter up your living room and you can't stand the stuff they've put in your living room they have paintings that 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 actually uh, represent values and beliefs that you don't like at all they're they're the opposite of your values so you're upset, but you can't do anything about it because they've kind of overwhelmed you. And they're crowding your house with all kinds of stuff that you would call junk. And in the, in the next couple of hours, because there's so many of these moving people, they're filling up the whole house and putting up beds and everything else, and you don't like it. Now, what happens is, as the hours go by in the day, you become disoriented because you realize arguing that these people are futile, they're going to do whatever they want to do, they don't respect your wishes. Let's say somebody in your house was a veteran and there's some certain, or just you're patriotic, so let's say you have some patriotic artwork of an American flag and other stuff. Uh, there's, there's a Bible that you like to have you know, displayed by by a coffee table or something in the living room. Well, the, the stuff that you like isn't even there. Instead of a Bible, they they, they put some. Uh, let's. I don't want to name another religion for obvious reasons, but a religion that has the opposite beliefs that you have, and so you feel very unsettled because everything around you that you're looking at is is like stuck in your mind. And, and you can't ignore it. You have to think about it because it's, it's in front of your eyes and you're not comfortable. That's just the normal process of what would happen if three moving vans were to pull up in a 
house that you just bought and started to decorate it and fill it with furniture and hang paintings that weren't yours. You, you would not like it. You would react very uncomfortably. In fact, you might even get sick to your stomach. And yet, you couldn't help not think about uh, what they were putting in your house because you can't escape it. Everywhere you look, you're seeing paintings that don't represent your values. You see furniture like you would never buy. And you can't get it out of your head because everywhere you walk, you can't escape it. It's like they've taken over your mind. Okay, I think you, you get the point here. This is what the media does, the mainstream media, the tech giants, etc. Now, in a sense, they could say, well, you invited us because you turned on the channel, so technically they're correct. But they, it's like they've pulled up these moving vans. It's not just three. Let's say it's a hundred. All these different media sources on the Internet and radio and TV, and they're filling your house with all this stuff, much of it you object to. And you can't escape it. Every time you turn, you're looking at some painting or some picture or, 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 or some piece of furniture or chair that, 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 that just it's just the opposite of you. But you can't get it out of your head, you see, because they've filled your house with stuff that they chose, not what you chose. So in this analogy, this is kind of what the media does when they take over your mind. Think of your mind as a somewhat newly purchased house, which is basically empty because you've just moved in. And all these ideas, these thoughts, these opinions, these images, these uh, sound bites, these pictures are filling your head and affecting your thinking. It's affecting your ideas. It's affecting your beliefs. Because you, you can't even think for yourself because they've crammed your... Your, your, your home with so much junk, you can't even see straight. The same thing is how it works with your mind. And so the next thing you know, without you even realizing it, because it's in your home, you subconsciously, even though you don't want to, you, you find yourself inescapably, even though it's against every emotion in you, thinking of all this stuff that's alien to you as your home. So, with mind control, there's a similar principle. They move in all these ideas, all these beliefs, all these pictures, but they do it in such an overwhelming manner that, in a sense, they take over your mind by crowding out, to use the house metaphor, by crowding out your own paintings, your own furniture, the stuff that you believe in, except... In the analogy, we're talking about your mind and subconscious mind. They're crowding out all your thoughts, your beliefs, your images. They're crowding it all out and filling it with their stuff. That causes people to become disoriented. But it also causes people, if, it's, if, the, if the foreign stuff stays in there long enough, people begin to accept it. They get used to it. And so... Even in myself, who, who studies this kind of thing, I have found myself thinking thoughts, and I have no problem with critical analysis, but I've found myself thinking critical thoughts or, or looking at things from a point of view that I know is not my point of view. Because when I, when I think through these thoughts that appear to be originating from the inner Paul or the inner you, I, I analyze them and I realize, hey, wait a minute, those aren't my thoughts. I don't think that way. Because when I play these thoughts out, they don't at all fit in with my beliefs, my research. They've been planted in there, you see? Because when I think them out, when I play out these thoughts in my mind, um, they ultimately end up being false ideas. Um, they end up being 
lies, they end up being non-truths, because when I analyze them and I compare them to historical facts, economic facts, or the facts that I just happen to know about various situations, they reveal themselves as lies. You see, I would never think those thoughts because I happen to know the truth about that situation because of research or reading I've done. Now, this is kind of how mind control and propaganda and social engineering works. So, the the key here is the science of brainwashing and mind control and propaganda um, is a highly sophisticated, advanced science. Far more advanced than most people realize. In other words, Technology and science and psychology and neuropsychiatry, along with communications technologies like film, television, music, radio, etc., have, have advanced to the point that programming somebody's mind uh, is something that is easily done, and it can be done on a scientific and highly reliable basis. And so you need to know that. And you need to do what you can to educate your children and your friends about it. Otherwise, people will be like sponges. The average person's mind is like a sponge. It just sucks up anything that's near it. And they think it's their own thoughts. Now, this has become a huge burden on my heart that the Holy Spirit has put upon me. As I've shared with you many, many times, since early childhood, when I say early childhood, I'm talking about way back, five, six years old or younger, I believe without any question that God, and and this is before I was born again, this is before I was saved, this is when I was still raised to be an atheist in an intellectual home in New York City. I believe that God and the Holy Spirit from my earliest childhood memories has been leading my thoughts, my reading, my thinking, what I have been exposed to in terms of of the good things. Um, The Holy Spirit and, and God has been very instrumental in, in shaping what I was exposed to what books I read, and then illuminating them through the spirit of truth, teaching me from all kinds of secular books, teaching me on a far, far deeper level than the school system could or any other thing could. The Holy Spirit has been very active in my mind and in developing developing me as a person. Now, I believe that the Holy Spirit and God has done the same thing in your life to different degrees, perhaps in completely different areas. Because we have to remember the foundational principle of truth, which is that God knew you before the foundation of the world to be here for such a time as this, which simply means God knew you personally. He knew the amount of hairs on your head, He knew uh, who you were, what your life would be all about. He knew which gifts both uh, and talents, both natural and spiritual, he put in you before the foundation of the world. He knew which time period, city, nation you would be born in, who your parents would be. He knew all this before the beginning of time because God has a supernatural plan for your life. And so he downloaded into you all kinds of stuff to enable you to fulfill that plan. Now, we all have different callings. Therefore, how the Lord shaped me and how the Lord influenced me would would be, in, in many cases, different than what the Lord did in your life because you have a different calling, most likely, than I have. In some areas, it would be similar. Um, you also have different giftings, or in some areas, it would be similar. But... Before, long before I was aware of it, long before I had any clue whatsoever 
that the Lord was going to use me in this area or that area. I mean, talk about, I had no clue whatsoever. It's not like I had a plan. The Lord was developing me. And the Lord has been developing you. Because we all, we can have similar gifts, but we many times have different gifts and talents. So, you see, you and I, we know the truth about reality. We know the truth about human existence. We know the truth about uh, the, the birth of every man or woman into this world. You and I know the truth. See, we have not been, unless we have surrendered the truth of the Word of God for a lie, you and I know the ultimate truth about reality. And therefore, because Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, we know and are free because we know the truth about human existence and our existence and reality. And and quite simply, this is uh, a great deal of the truth. What I'm going to share share with you in the next few sentences, sentences, The children and adults of this present world system have been taught in the public educational systems, the schools, the universities, the media, science, politics, every every avenue of of information uh, that comes at people. Um, They have been indoctrinated to believe a lie. They have been taught a lie, as if it was a a truth. They have been taught that life has no meaning, that your human existence ultimately has no meaning. They have been taught the lie that there is no purpose to life, that there is no God, there's no creator, there's no designer, that there's only random chance and accidents in, in what is called an impersonal random universe. And so they have been taught to believe this lie based on no scientific evidence whatsoever that every man or woman is essentially the product of a random evolutionary process, which simply means that mankind randomly and accidentally evolved over 500 million years through a random mixture of molecules and, uh, you know, protoplasm, and, and then eventually it evolved into to, to microscopic uh, living organisms, and then millions of years passed, and, uh, you know, simple uh, life forms like little tiny ants and stuff, and You know the story. And as time goes by, mankind randomly evolved into, let's say, uh, monkeys, apes, chimpanzees, and then finally uh, homo sapiens or men and women as we know it. But there was no design, no creator behind it. This was all done by accidents. And life evolved from non-life and one distinct species would evolve into a completely different, higher-level species, and thus men and women came to be. And in this lying uh, um, viewpoint about reality, there is no God, there is no such thing as right or wrong, there is no law of God, there is no um, um, conscience, there is no... Uh, uh, morality, there is no such thing as traditional moral values, there is no such thing as an infinite personal living God of the universe. Everything is accidental, everything is impersonal, and as such, what's left over when you really analyze evolution is that we live in a brutal, cruel universe because the basic tenets of this evolutionary theory is that man arrived over 500 million years of random chance based on this Darwinian principle of the fittest survive, or the law of the jungle, that might makes right, and pure brute force, pure power, 
gives you the right to dominate, to make extinct other people, other species. There's nothing wrong or right about it. The same thing with whatever you want to do. If it feels good, do it. Um, and then modern man, you know, realized that they couldn't come quite out and say what they really believed, so they tacked on the the lie at the end of it. As long as it doesn't, you know, between, it's between two consenting adults. Whatever feels good, do it. As, as long as it's between two consenting adults. But you see, evolutionary theory it doesn't have a little add-on between two consenting adults. Evolutionary theory really teaches the satanic principle. The satanic principle which Aleister Crowley, the great Satanist, taught, which is do what thou wilt. Whatever you want to do, do it. It's brutal. It's cruel. And that's what they believe, you see. And yet, that total belief system, they have no scientific evidence whatsoever to back up evolutionary theory. That's just how out, what an outrageous lie it is. There are about 80 million fossil records, and they do not have one single fossil record that proves that one species has ever evolved into a different species, ever, and a different species of a higher order, ever. But they have absolutely no record out of 80 million fossil records of one species evolving into a completely different species, or one shred of proof that life came from non-life. The entire thing is a farce. It's the emperor has no clothes. Now, it is essential that you understand that if people were thinking in their rational, logical, God-given minds, if people were not scientifically dumbed down, and if they were truly using their God-given critical thinking abilities of reason, logic, analysis, study, observation, it would be brutally obvious to anybody whose brain worked properly the way God created it. That evolutionary theory is a complete lie. It's impossible to have ever happened. And it is, it is so absurd, it's such a ridiculous theory, that it doesn't even deserve a moment's consideration. That's what would be the normal reaction if people were functioning psychologically and mentally as God created them. The only way that people end up believing this, this total irrational nonsense is that they have been brainwashed... They have been subjected to mind control, brainwashing, hypnosis, indoctrination, and social engineering, and programming. And they've been put in like a subconscious hypnotic state. It is because of those reasons that they believe this absolute nonsense. And there's a reason for it. There's a reason why Billions of people on planet Earth have literally been programmed to, to accept this total nonsense. And we're going to expose this. Because when you expose this, you're exposing one of the biggest secrets. A secret that is so powerful, so deadly, that it literally has an iron grip on the minds and hearts of billions of people. But in a moment, we're going to expose it, and hopefully you will help spread the truth, which will expose it even further and set people free. We're going to expose it in just a minute. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. By the way, we have uh, all kinds of resources for free for you at the Paul McGuire Report, which is paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Join me tomorrow night, Thursday, September 20th, 2018, for a special meeting I'm holding at the Sportsman's Lodge in Studio City beginning at 6 p.m. sharp. And the title of the meeting is um, Releasing the Supernatural Power of God in Your World. And I'll be teaching and ministering from God's prophetic word. We'll be... uh, 
gathering together in the presence of the Lord, in the glory of the Lord. Um, there'll be rich teaching from the Word of God, and I will make myself available to pray for every single person personally uh, who desires prayer. People will be ministered to. They will be set free. God will move powerfully. And I know right now, even as I'm sharing this announcement about tomorrow's meeting, um, that the Holy Spirit is calling many of you to physically come to the meeting. And so if God's calling you, and he's calling many of you, you need to obey him, even if it means inconvenience. You obey the Lord. I have done this for years. I'm not asking you to do something that I wouldn't do. I've done this for years. I've driven to meetings because I felt the Lord calling me to them. And that meant inconvenience. But let me tell you something. Maybe I had to drive a couple hours more each way than I planned. But what I, the rich deposits of God's truth that were given to me at these different meetings and events that I've attended over the years, they have affected the destiny of my life and the, the, value, the value of the truth that was imparted to me at these meetings have changed and enhanced the quality of my life. I wouldn't be the person I am today. I wouldn't have the blessing of the Lord on my life and family uh, that I have today without being obedient to God when he called me to, to make, in retrospect, uh, small sacrifices in driving to meetings where God was telling me to come. And so I'm not asking you to do something that I don't do and didn't do. God's calling you. You need to come. And uh, you maps, all that stuff is available at paulmcguire.us. Obviously, the meeting is free. Parking is free. But you must register. So you go to paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us to register. And pray. And if the Lord tells you to bring somebody or to bring a number of people, then be obedient to the Lord and bring them. Drive them. Don't just expect them to drive themselves. It doesn't work that way anymore. Be willing to drive them or meet them somewhere uh, and then drive them or have them drive. But obey the Lord. If the Lord puts somebody on your heart, then do what God tells you to do. Now, also... If, if you're considering bringing someone and you have a check in your spirit from the spirit, the, the spirit of the Lord is giving you a check saying, no, don't bring them, then don't bring them. Because we only want people in the meeting that God is calling to be there. We're not interested in just filling seats. So visit paulmcguire.us. Make sure you register. There's a map and all that stuff there. And um, remember that the Lord pours out his Holy Spirit mightily at these meetings. I continually meet people years after we hold meetings whose lives have been dramatically changed as they had a personal encounter with the Lord at these meetings. People are set free and literally, and I thank God for this, the destiny of people's lives are changed forever. I'm, I'm talking about serious changes for the better. The whole outplaying of their life is changed for the better because they chose to obey the Lord. And that's what it's about, choosing to obey the Lord. So I hope to see you there personally. Please introduce yourself to me. And that's at the Sportsman's Lodge, Thursday, September 20th. That's tomorrow at 6 p.m. And uh, make sure to register. Parking's free. PaulMcGuire.us. We'll be back in just a second. And by the way, help spread the word on that. Let your friends know, the ones that you believe the, that, that the Lord uh, would like you to invite. Share it on social media or email. Uh, forward, forward to them and give them a personal invitation. Because, you know, people come where they're personally invited. This is the Paul McGuire Report on Paul McGuire. We'll be back in just a second. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. And we've been talking about the results that occur in the human mind when people are saturated with symbols, information, pictures, audio, video. Um, what that does 
in shaping people's thoughts, beliefs, and behavior. And then we were giving you an explanation as to why people who you would think would be ordinarily intelligent would behave like such idiots when it comes to believing the completely uh, imaginary theory of evolution. They believe it as if it's a fact. Well, if it is a fact, here's a, here's a question. Where are the facts? <laughs> because guess what? The facts don't exist. And the people are set such in such a deep trance state regarding that, such a deep mind program regarding that, that they're, they're, they're afraid of actually like that metaphor where the emperor is convinced that he's dressed in the finest of clothing and the reality is he's totally naked and everybody's treating him like he's like the king is dressed in such great clothing and he goes out in a public parade and 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 people are applauding him and pretending that he's clothed and this great uh, expensive clothing but young one young boy uh, who hasn't surrendered to group think shouts out innocently the king is naked the king is naked and suddenly it like breaks the collective trance state of the people and they and then they get the courage to start seeing what they already knew was true but to convince themselves to believe in illusion suddenly their trance hypnotic state breaks and they realize hey guess what the, the, the king is naked the emperor has no clothes so why does this happen because when you program people's minds you can convince them to believe anything no matter how irrational or absurd it is and and that's what i'm trying to drive out this is the burden the lord has given me in shaping my research because of the thousands of books that i've read my life experiences the people that imparted knowledge to me the area that I studied in at a university level, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, caused me to specialize, among many other subjects, but to specialize in this area of mind control. I did something I never intentionally sought out to, to understand, but I kept, it was inevitable. God wanted me to understand it because it's only by dismantling it and explaining it simply to people that then people can receive the truth. So the reason why um, the minds of countless millions of Americans right now are being bombarded from every angle 24-7 to hate Trump uh, through video, through audio, through radio, through computer, through, through the Internet, social media, is because... This is psychological warfare. This is, de- this is designed by people who are highly trained and skilled in the technology and science of mind control and persuasion. And the goal is to, to turn the people into being hostile towards Trump so that they will demand his, that he is removed from office through through whatever reason or, or through whatever excuse they give to remove them from office. This is a, a preparation phase to, to the next phase, which is to remove him. And this is psychological warfare. And you can do that when you know how to use propaganda and scientific mind control. One of the key principles of propaganda and scientific mind control is to play over and over again various messages and the key uh, word in uh, operational conditioning is repetition by repeating something over and over and over again you end up hypnotizing people to believe in anything you choose uh, to to cause them to believe in so repetition is one of numerous scientific principles of mind control, brainwashing, and propaganda to repeat over and over again. Repetition also causes us to learn. So repetition can be a positive thing. Uh, It depends what we're repeating. 
the repetition of truth can cause us to further understand and grow in the truth. But the repetition of lies and illusions, it is a scientific factor in brainwashing us, and ultimately, all brainwashing revolves around the understanding of a hypnotic state, or what is called a trance state. And going back thousands and thousands of years ago to ancient civilizations, such as Babylon and Egypt, um, and we talk about this in our book, by the way, The Babylon Code, that I wrote with Troy Anderson. These ancient civilizations, they knew how to put the kings, who called themselves god kings, knew how to put their subjects to control them through mind control by by creating hypnotic states, which was often done through false religions and occult ceremonies and drugs and music, etc., So the controlling of the masses by altering their state of consciousness has been with us since before Babylon in the Bible. And if you read Genesis 11 uh, in the Bible, which was was the world's first one-world government, one-world religion, and one-world economic system, it was a Luciferian system which God judged. But contained within that Luciferian system was a system that is explained further in Revelation 17 and uh, Revelation 18 called Mystery Babylon. Now remember, Mystery Babylon began in ancient Babylon at the time of the Tower of Babel. And what was the Tower of Babel? The Tower of Babel was on an architectural basis designed as a pyramidical tower. A pyramidical tower is called a ziggurat in terms of architecture. And it was a tower that would enable the people of Babylon to walk up the stairs, and it was built as a tower high into the sky. It had a very high elevation. And one of the reasons for that, it was a worship tower. So when people would climb to the very top of the Tower of Babel, They were, in a sense, entering the the sphere of the heavens where God dwelt. At least they thought they were entering into the heavens where God dwelt. So it tapped into the Luciferian spirit, which was the driving force behind Mystery Babylon. The worshippers in ancient Babylon thought that by going into the worship tower of the Tower of Babel, They would enter enter the heavens and they would be like God, which was Satan's original seductive sin in the garden through the, the serpent. They would be like gods because they would be at the elevation of God. And then at the top of that tower, they would conduct all kinds of Luciferian satanic ceremonies, which involved astrological worship with the stars and the zodiac and chanting, and ultimately, um, the Tower of Babel was occult technology. The Tower of Babel and the principles that allowed the people of ancient Babylon to construct the Tower of Babel, this kind of access to highly advanced futuristic technology and science This was first given to man um, on Mount Hermon. And now, as you recall, Mount Hermon was the location where where the first 200 fallen angels descended from heaven and descended upon Mount Hermon. And these fallen angels uh, were attracted to human women They mated with human women, and they produced the genetic hybrid, which consisted of the mixing of uh, human female DNA with fallen angel DNA, and they produced the hybrid race called the Rephium, and the descendants of the Rephium were called the Nephilim. And the Nephilim are, are people, and I believe they exist today, but they were the people that populated the land of Canaan 
Uh, they were the, the, the beings known as the giants in the land because the Nephilim, because of their DNA, were, were superhuman in size. They were giants. And Joshua and Caleb were assigned by God to go into the land of Canaan and conquer the giants in the land, which were the Nephilim. And remember, Canaan was really the promised land. The, the full geographic extent of Canaan is the promised land of Israel. But it was populated by hostile forces, which were the Nephilim, the giants of old, who had corrupted DNA, the DNA of fallen angels and humans. And so God ordered Joshua and Caleb to destroy the giants. And this, by the way, was also the reason for the flood of Noah. The flood of Noah was not simply a judgment Uh, upon man's wickedness, although that was part of it, but the primary reason for the flood of Noah as a judgment is the flood of Noah was a targeted DNA digital judgment designed to wipe out all the animal species, human species, and other species whose DNA had been corrupted through the DNA of the fallen angels. And God wanted to repopulate the earth with pure and undefiled DNA, the same DNA that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden as they were created in the image of God, Um, Noah and his family uh, had uncorrupted DNA. Noah was commanded to build an ark. They assembled the animal species and other species two by two, male and female, and all of their DNA was uncorrupted. So after the corrupted DNA was wiped out through the flood, God commanded Noah and his family and the animals to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth again. So, what also occurred on Mount Hermon was the fact that the fallen angels gave mankind advanced technology, advanced science, advanced mathematics, medicine, the knowledge of herbs, uh, and all kinds of other um, uh, esoteric practices. Uh, These sciences and technologies that the fallen angels gave to mankind on Mount Hermon uh, were the exact same technology that allowed them to build the uh, technological construction of the Tower of Babel and allowed uh, mankind to build the various super civilizations such as Atlantis and many other civilizations. So the technologies and sciences that the fallen angels gave mankind included the science and technology of things like modern mind control and the understanding of the subconscious mind and the conscious mind and how to program it. Because you see, the control of a human being against their will is not something that God does, that's something that Lucifer does. So it's a Luciferian, all uh, propaganda, all scientific mind control, all um, advertising, essentially, uh, all Propaganda, social engineering is ultimately based on ancient sorcery, ancient magic, and ancient Luciferian te- teachings imparted uh, to mankind by the fallen angels. And we need to understand that. We need to understand that dynamic and where it came from. And we need to be sophisticated about it um, because. The book of Revelation teaches us that in the last days, prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, that spiritual deception will vastly increase. There will be an increase in false teachers, false prophets, and false Christs, and they will be energized by a satanic Luciferian spirit. But they will understand how to capture people's minds through scientific mind control, hypnosis, brainwashing, the use of drugs, and things like that. So God wants his people to be uh, equipped with the knowledge of the truth so that they don't succumb to this invasion of their minds. In fact, 
when you read the Bible and biblical prophecies, you read that in the latter part of the last days, the great apostasy will occur, which means the great falling away from the faith of God and the faith in God's word will occur even in the church. The great apostasy is the great falling away. How will it occur? Through scientific mind control, through hypnosis, through uh, sorcery, etc. And then the Bible also warns that uh, a great delusion or a very, very powerful spiritual deception will come upon people with such power that it will deceive, the Bible says, if possible, even the elect, those people that God chose to be his before the foundation of the world. So you see this activity of supernatural uh, delusion, supernatural deception, is going to increase and has increased in the last days. We're in the last days. And the Bible teaches us about this in great, in, in great detail. And ultimately where this is going is we're going to see a return of Mystery Babylon, the, 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 the Babylonian system that God destroyed in Genesis 11, in Revelation 17 and 18, we read about the return of the great harlot, uh, Mystery Babylon, Economic Babylon, Commercial Babylon, and Babylon, which represents a one-world government, a one-world religion, and a one-world economic system. And who is it that heads up this Mystery Babylon system? Well, it's the Antichrist who rules the one-world government and is indwelt by Satan, and it's the false prophet who uh, is in charge of the one world economic system, the distribution of the mark of the beast, 666, and the false prophet is in charge of the one world religion. And notice how the one world religion and the one world economic system uh, are totally integrated in the last days. The technology of the Mark of the Beast system, 666, is going to be some kind of biochip implant or nanochip implant or DNA modification. And remember, in, in the tribulation period, no one can buy or sell without receiving the Mark of the Beast, which will be on their right hand or their forehead. And in order to receive the Mark of the Beast, you must renounce Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you must publicly pledge to worship the Antichrist as God. And this is a very serious thing. Notice also that the false prophet uh, will have all kinds of supernatural powers given to him by Satan so, so as to deceive people into believing the Antichrist is God so that the people of the earth will, will worship the Antichrist as God and the false prophet will perform all kinds of supernatural signs and lying wonders including calling fire down from heaven. Now, let's look at that for a moment. The Bible says that the false prophet will perform all kinds of signs and lying wonders. Daniel predicts this also. Now, what does this mean? This means that there will be a powerful delusion, a spiritual delusion, a powerful spiritual deception. Because remember, the false prophet is going to deceive many through his false signs and wonders. And so this involves not, this, it's not just... Uh, raw supernatural power, this is the, the, the Luciferian power of, of Satan to deceive through the false prophet, but what will be utilized and employed to, to, to communicate this powerful spiritual deception are things like scientific mind control, hypnosis, social engineering, uh, propaganda, uh, technology, along with supernatural power and demonic power, and computers and social media, etc. They will all converge into kind of creating a matrix 
which will consist of a global virtual reality based on an illusion or a lie. And people will, will live as if this matrix is real, when in fact it's not real, it's an artificial reality based on a lie. Because the world, this present world system is based on a lie. It's based on the lie of evolution. It's based on the lie that there is no God. It's based on all kinds of lies. So, God wants his people to be prepared in the last days. It's the only way they can be victorious. The only way you can be victorious in the last days is to understand and have the knowledge of God and to understand the specific dynamics by which deception, mind control, propaganda, brainwashing, hypnosis, how these things actually work and how they work in conjunction with uh, media and other means. You know, the Lord is trying to equip his remnant church, that's the true believers, and I believe that many of you listening to the Paul McGuire Report are true believers in Jesus Christ. The Lord is trying to equip you in the latter part of the last days to, to bring in the last day's soul harvest, to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to make disciples of all nations, to bring in a biblical revival, and again, to occupy the land until he comes, or to do business until he comes. Now remember, we're involved in spiritual warfare. So Lucifer doesn't want you to do, or the church to do any of those things. So what is Lucifer's primary strategy in preventing us as Christians from doing those things, and preventing us as the body of Christ from doing those things? Well, he uses primarily spiritual deception, but also he wages spiritual warfare against us. Now, I want to read something to you in the book of Ephesians about how you and I are to uh, wear the whole armor of God for the very purpose of being victorious in this last day's spiritual warfare with the demons and Lucifer. So in Ephesians 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's what we're going to do at the uh, meeting on Thursday. We're going to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles of the devil? The schemes, the strategies, the lies. The mind control, those are the wiles of the devil. How are you going to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil? You have to understand what you're dealing with. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. What's the truth? The truth of God's word. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now notice this, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I'm going to read it again. And take the helmet of salvation. Where does the helmet go? Well, obviously, the helmet goes over your head and brain area. Because one of Satan's primary attacks, his fiery darts which we can defeat with the shield of faith, but also wearing the helmet of salvation, is against our mind, our thoughts, our beliefs, our perceptions. A great deal of the battle is the battle for the mind. The helmet of salvation protects our brain and mind from the spiritual warfare of the devil in the last days. So we must wear the helmet of salvation. And then it says, and the sword of the Spirit. 
What is the sword of the Spirit? It's the Word of God. We must renew our minds with the Word of God. We must know the Word of God. And that way, we can defeat the adversary. And then we pray, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication in the saints. This is how we are victorious in the spiritual warfare. Now, You, and I'm not trying to convey a sense of paranoia, but there needs to be a healthy recognition of a basic reality. If you're attempting to live for Jesus, if you're attempting to serve Jesus, if you're attempting to obey the Lord Jesus Christ, the devil hates your guts. He's going to target you, and he's going to aim his weapons at you. That's not paranoia. That's a healthy dose of reality. You don't have to be frightened because if you're wearing the full armor of God, the devil can't hurt you. And remember, the devil is not interested in attacking Christians who are basically doing the will of the devil versus doing the will of God. But he is interested in blocking you, the obedient remnant, people who really want to serve the Lord. So how, how do we defeat the devil? We have to be knowledgeable of his wiles, of his tricks. And this is why the Lord led me to study deception and scientific mind control and things like that. Because those are just fancy words for the works of the devil that began in the Garden of Eden. Notice Adam and Eve, the children of God, had paradise. Notice that Adam and Eve were given the supernatural authority by God to rule and reign planet Earth and the Garden of Eden. They had dominion over the Garden of Eden. Notice that. They had everything they could possibly want. But notice also that the devil came to Eve first and then Adam, and the devil indwelt this reptilian serpent who convinced Eve, then Adam, through the wiles of the devil. Now, notice what that is. The trickery, the language. Notice that when the devil is tempting Eve, he's very carefully twisting what God said. He's, he's, he's twisting every nuance. He's changing the plain meaning of God's word. You know what that is? That is an example of the very first time propaganda, hypnosis, mind control is being used. The devil is the author of propaganda, mind control, and hypnosis. And he's using those powers on Adam and Eve. Because, see, propaganda is presenting the truth in a distorted way to control people. Hypnosis is is simply repeating something often enough and saying it in a seducing, calm tone so people give their minds over and, and they surrender control of their minds. That's what brainwashing is. The, the enemy gets you to surrender control of your mind. And and hypnotic states. All of this is what Lucifer was doing. Now, I want to share with you a very powerful secret. And one is that I've never heard taught in a Christian church, ever. Like so many of these truths that are so important. Let me read this to you. We've read it before, but I really want you to focus in on it for a second. Because it's going to expose something. It's going to expose what the wiles of the devil means. So in Genesis 3, it says in verse 1, Now the serpent, remember the serpent is possessed by the devil, was more cunning than any beast of the field. What does cunning mean? Crafty, slick, manipulative. Okay? And he was more cunning than any beast in the field. And the serpent said to the woman, 
Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice how strategically, using mind control, using salesmanship, using manipulation, using techniques of hypnosis, using propaganda. This is all what the devil is doing through the serpent. You notice he doesn't uh, come at Eve with a direct confrontation. No, that would break the hypnotic state. He comes with a question, like a friend, you know. Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The goal is to very cunningly get her to doubt the word of God. He doesn't attack it head on. That would be too obvious. It's the wiles of the devil, the craftiness of the devil. That's what mind control is all about. And then he slightly distorts and twists the word of God. Notices, notice that, and this is the same with propaganda, he mixes the truth with lies. Propaganda, brainwashing, mind control, it, it's always effective to the degree you mix truth with lies. So the devil says, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Again, a question, the soft approach. And the woman said to the serpent, naively, she's opening up, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Well, that's true. And this is a technique in salesmanship, by the way. And I'm not saying all salesmen are evil and all the rest of that stuff. But I've been through intensive sales training, and I've trained people intensively in sales training, in sales and marketing and public relations. So I understand this. He's getting her to, 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 to go with the flow with one thought. Because, you see, it's easier to direct somebody and control their mind when they're flowing in a direction that's cooperative versus then opposing them. So, he says, um, uh, um, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of every fruit of the trees of the garden. Now, that's a yes statement. And any salesman who's been trained in sales knows that when you get somebody to make a yes statement, you continue in the flow of asking questions that, that will elicit a yes statement until you finally bring the person into the state of consciousness where they say, yes, I'll buy this, etc., etc. Now, I'm not saying selling is evil. I'm selling, selling is persuasion. But from persuasion, we can go to mind control and propaganda, influence. Now look what the serpent says. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now that was the the woman saying that. Okay, so notice that very subtly, the woman is remembering uh, a negative. Now it's a no. Okay, you shall not eat of that tree, the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, because if you touch it, you'll die. That, that's a no. He, he got, the devil got her in the yes mode. Now, now she brings up a no mode. But look how the devil answers. It's with such expertise, such hypnotic control. For God knows that, in the, oh no, he starts with this. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. You see how smoothly he lays on that sweet layer of a lie to cover the truth, which she just said, which is that if she touches the fruit, she'll die. He, he doesn't freak out. It doesn't faze him. He keeps his calm tone of voice, and he says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. But you see how melodic, how smooth he covers over the truth with a lie. And this is a serious lie, but he makes it so casual, so easy, just like hypnosis, just like mind control, just like persuasion, just like advertising. For God knows that that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now the serpent is twisting the truth. 
He's taking the, the clear warning of God and he's smoothing it over. He's distorting it, just like propaganda and mind control. And he says, and then he puts the emphasis on this, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, that's not really what God said, is it? No, it's not at all what God said. Verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise... Okay, so what he's done, what's implied in the script, is she is now... The devil has convinced her to take her mind off the critical analysis of what God actually said. The devil has hypnotized her into stop thinking clearly and logically about precisely what God said, and and the devil has got her to shift her attention in a in a kind of hypnotic way into the sensor the the sensory beauty and attractiveness of the fruit and how desirable it is and now the devil changes it that the the tree that the that this fruit is desirable but it will also make you wise so he's changed what god said it's now gone from if you eat of the tree you'll die to you eat of the tree you'll be wise what a distortion of the truth and so She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And then, bam, the truth. They activate the law of sin and death, and they're under a curse. And this curse is upon us today. That's why we all die. And not only that, they lost their they lost their supernatural authority over the Garden of Eden. Their bodies began to degenerate and die. They lost their supernatural authority and dominion of planet Earth. They lost everything. They were kings and queens. And now, by listening to the lies of the devil, they have become beggars, dying beggars. Now, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that for a moment. They listened to the lies of the devil, the propaganda, the mind control, the hypnosis. And by disobeying God's word, they went from being kings and queens who would live eternally, who had everything, in a nanosecond, by disobeying God's word, they go from kings and queens to being beggars that are dying. They're cursed. Think about that with your God-given rational mind. Doesn't it sound very similar to a lot of things that we are being told and persuaded to believe through the media, through technology, through social media in our society today? Let me give you an example an example of how a false belief system can kill you, but how it's packaged through mind control, brainwashing, and propaganda to get people to believe it. One example among many. The political theory of communism or Marxism Now, the political theory of communism and Marxism is very similar to the lie the devil told Adam and Eve. The people that sell or uh, attempt to convert people into believing into communism or Marxism, the Marxists and communists themselves will tell you that they conquer people by conquering their minds, and the communists will tell you themselves that they use scientific mind control, and they use brainwashing, and they use propaganda. They're, They're very upfront about it. They don't lie. They tell you that it's perfectly justifiable to use propaganda, mind control, and brainwashing. So they are very sophisticated in the science of propaganda, mind control, and brainwashing. 
And this is what they do. They go from nation to nation. They go to Christian nations like America, where there's still a lot of people who believe in the Bible and Jesus Christ. And they use the media. They use books. They use movies. They use radio. They use the Internet. And their spokesmen, their leaders, communicate lies to the masses, just like the devil did to Adam and Eve. And they say to them, now, again, America is not like the Garden of Eden, not even close. But America, at least you're somewhat free, you have some opportunities, and you have some wealth. So, comparatively speaking, as you compare it with other nations, it's still a pretty good deal with all its faults. So the communist leaders, whether they come as professors or film directors or whatever, they come promising paradise. Now notice they actually use the word paradise, which is what Adam and Eve had. Paradise. They said, we're coming to bring you a worker's paradise. We're going to give you paradise on earth. If you become a communist revolutionary or a Marxist revolutionary, but remember, they're very slick. They know the wiles of the devil, so they're not even going to use the word revolutionary. They're not going to use the word communist or Marxist. They're going to use the word progressive or or democratic socialist. And they promise that masses, workers' paradise. We're going to give you paradise on earth. That's like saying you're going to have heaven on earth. That's what they say. You're going to have heaven on earth. And then they say, we're going to redistribute the wealth. So you won't be poor anymore. We're going to establish an all-powerful state that will make sure that there's no people who are filthy rich and then there's people that are poor. We're going to distribute all the wealth, all the houses, all the property, all the jewels equally. So everyone will, ha- will, will share in this worker's paradise equally. Wow, these are big promises. Th- these promises are just as big as the promises that Satan told Adam and Eve. And then they say, we're going to implement social justice. And so they really work hard on all the people that are disenfranchised, people of of different ethnic groups, people of uh, racial groups that have been discriminated against, and and, uh, any other group of people that has been persecuted, treated in a prejudicial manner, or treated harshly or cruelly, they they specialize in coming to those groups and saying, we're going to redistribute the wealth, we're going to create heaven on earth, And we're going to create social justice. So we're going to pass laws that don't benefit the rich. And we're going to make sure everybody has equal opportunities. Everything's fair. We're going to create heaven on earth. All you got to do is join us. But in order to do this, the communists say, you're going to have to, and they'll use any kind of words they want, join us. And we're going to have to overthrow this corrupt, evil, Christian capitalist system. And then they sell the message through brainwashing, through mind control, through uh, uh, propaganda in movies and and speaking and politics and books, etc. So what happens? What happens? And again, they admit that they use brainwashing. Part of the brainwashing process involves you must demonize everything that you want to get rid of, such as Christianity, such as capitalism, such as the Constitution, such as freedoms. You must demonize it. You must make it look horrible. So they have systematically, through propaganda and brainwashing, demonized the church demonized the family, demonized Christianity, demonized America, and they have so brainwashed the peoples in America and the college students that they have made, they through lies, based on nuggets of truth, they have 
brainwashed people into believing that America is the most evil, selfish nation on earth, that the family unit is responsible for all the evils in society, that private property ownership is evil, that capitalism is evil, that ownership is evil, and that only communism is salvation. Then they also say the belief in a Christian God is evil and that the Bible is hate speech. This is what their brainwashing does. So they finally get the people to have a revolution, whether it's through the ballot box or through guns or bullets, whatever it takes. Okay, but what happens? Remember, Adam and Eve were filled with enthusiasm and passion about, you know, Boy, they're going to eat from this fruit, and they were going to become like God. They were they were high as a kite with an expectation of what the devil had promised them. But what happened after they did what the devil had promised them through the serpent? It all went bad. They died. They went from kings and queens to being paupers that were dying. So all the people who join in on the uh, promises of a communist Marxist revolution, what happens is they lose all their freedoms... They lose all their freedoms. They're worse off than they've ever been. They're poorer than they've ever been. There's no uh, wealth redistribution. It's, just, it's the same thing, except now the elite are the members of the Communist Party. It's just to change names. The poor are still there. you still got the rich. you still got the poor. People are still oppressed. But now you're worse off because you can't complain about it or you can get shot. And there's not one single example in reality of any successful communist Marxist revolution. It doesn't deliver what it promises. It actually delivers the opposite. It produces a society of misery, cruelty, brutality, and hell on earth. That's Look, if people weren't being brainwashed, they could think clearly. Let me give you an illustration. Communist China is in the process of developing a computerized digital dictatorship using the internet and computers. And basically what they've done is that they have the name and telephone number and birth date of every citizen in communist China. And everything that individuals do from their childhood on that is good, that is something that the Communist Party approves of, they get, they, they accumulate positive points. The positive, more positive points they get by behaving and acting and thinking like good communists, the better houses they get, the better jobs they get, all these opportunities open up for them if they have lots of good points. And it's all monitored by a computer and everybody's under mass surveillance. But everything you do that's against communism, you accumulate negative points. Even things as small as jaywalking, that's a violation of communism. And so you get negative points. Now what happens is, this becomes a total control system. And you say, well, that sounds great. Well, really? Remember, the communist part uh, promise you heaven on earth. So, If you want to believe in Jesus and the Bible, you get a lot of negative points. And if you keep believing in the Bible, if you pray privately, if you talk to somebody about Jesus, you get get points taken away. Eventually, you can't get a job because you have negative points for being a Christian. You can't get food. Negative points for being a Christian. The only way you can get positive points is to renounce your faith in Jesus Christ, stop praying, stop reading the Word of God. Well, what kind of society is that? That's hell on earth. They're controlling through mass surveillance every part of your life, everything you think, do, and act is under total control. You're totally dominated. You're you're a slave ruled more than any other slave has ever been. Now let me ask you an obvious question that should come to anybody whose mind can still think freely. If the system of communism in China and communism in other nations was so great as they say it is, 
Why is it that it requires an all-powerful computer mass surveillance system where everybody's given a number and everything they think, do, and say accumulates positive and negative points and they're punished and rewarded accordingly? In other words, if communism is such a good deal, why do they have to have this brutal, totalitarian, all-powerful surveillance and computer system monitoring every single single individual. Well, it's obvious if you can think. It's because people don't like that. It's the ultimate form of slavery. So in order to get people to comply with this worker's paradise or communism, you have to force them. And the way you force them is you create a total control computer system mass surveillance system, and you force people to obey every little principle of communism. They have to be forced because the penalties of getting negative points are death, starvation, unemployment for life, imprisonment, or being killed. Now, if it was such a good system, they wouldn't need to have a surveillance system. They wouldn't need to have the computers. People would be joyously obeying all the communist principles. Because why wouldn't they? It's the greatest thing on earth. The truth of the matter is, it's hell on earth. And the only way you can get people to follow it is to force them through control and threat of death. That's the same that's true of every other communist country. Secret police, monitored, spied on, shot, killed, tortured if you disobey the Communist Party. Hey, if communism was the workers' paradise they said it was, if communism was really delivering on all the promises that it claims to deliver, people would be standing in line around planet Earth to get in on it. But they're not. Communism is a horrible slave master. And that's why you don't have anybody sneaking across the border to get into communist China, communist Russia, communist North Korea, or any other communist nation. Nobody is sneaking across the borders to get into communist nations. Why? Because it stinks. People are sneaking across the borders to get out of communist nations and to get into free nations like America. The nation, that's, the nation that is criticized the most on planet Earth is the nation everybody's trying to sneak in across the border to get into. But you see, college students, the media, they can't think logically. They're brainwashed. And they can't even see the obvious. And so they're prisoners. It's important that you educate yourself about exactly how this process works. And I want to encourage you to get a copy of my book, Conquering the Matrix, where you can find out for yourself whether you're brainwashed or people you know are brainwashed, how to break that programming, to read Mass Awakening, where you can understand how people can artificially generate a mass awakening for good or evil. You see all these people getting riled up in the United States. You you see artificially generated hatred, an artificially generated race war. I expose all that in Mass Awakening. It's all done through propaganda and mind control. And then in the book, um, A Prophecy of the Future of America, I talk about the music stars, the hip-hop stars, Beyonce, Jay-Z, Katy Perry, the Illuminati, and how they use mind control programming in music videos, in music, and culture. You need to understand that for you and the sake of your children. And then in Trumpocalypse, well, Trumpocalypse, you've got to get a copy of, because you're not going to understand why they are using every technology of mind control, brainwashing, propaganda, the media, they have to remove Donald Trump from office because of only one reason. He has done the best, you know, whatever you think of Donald Trump, he's grown the economy better than any other president. He has given more employment to people of minorities than any other president. 
The only reason Donald Trump is under attack through brainwashing and mind control is for one reason. The globalist elite, who are the plantation owners, they have said publicly many times that Donald Trump is the single most greatest threat to their plan for a global government that they rule and that will benefit them. You see, Donald Trump is the greatest threat to the globalist elite secret total control of America and the rest of the world. And the only people who believe that the plans of the globalist elite is to create heaven on earth through some kind of one world government, the only people who believe that are those people who are brainwashed and under mind control. We need to spread the truth. We need to educate people in every nation on planet earth while there's still time. The day will come when I will not be able to speak to you through the internet. They'll have it locked down. You see, people who are in spiritual darkness will do everything they can to destroy the light. Remember that. Remember that. Value your freedom. And the way you keep yourself free is you know the truth. And that's what we do here at Paul McGuire Ministries. We communicate the truth. And in order to do that, I need your constant prayers. I need your help in doing an end run around censorship. And I need you to seek the Lord and whatever the Lord tells you to do in terms of your financial contributions and donations, do it. We have time. God has given us a window of opportunity. And the truth will set people free, but we've got to communicate it. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Paul